Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Design Thinking and Recruitment, The Honeywell Story, Keeping User Experience at the Center, in partnership with People Strong. This is Ritika from People Matters, and before moving to the agenda of the day, let me give you a brief of the topic. When you're a global brand with reach across multiple locations and time zones, hiring the right talent at the right time is a Herculean task. The trick is to keep different users, like hiring managers, recruiters, engaged in order to deliver business benefits. Here is how Honeywell, a Fortune 100 software industrial talent technology leader, manages hiring right and fast while delivering a seamless user experience in the process. The webinar will cover the business context, how it all worked, its impact, and what's next in recruitment? Let me now introduce the speakers for this webinar. We have the privilege of having with us Anshuman Srivastava, Assistant Vice, Vice President, RPO, Sales and Solutions at People Strong HR Services, and Sumira Paul, Director Staffing at Honeywell India. Anshuman Srivastava comes with over 16 years of experience in business management, consulting, recruitment, and manpower outsourcing. He has handled recruitment across industry verticals and is experienced professional in setting and managing mid to large multi-location teams, business development, client relations and engagement, team building, mentoring and coaching, profit and revenue management, and cost management across industries. Sumida Paul has over 14 years of experience in various human resources functions like talent and organization development, performance management, compensation, learning, talent acquisition and staffing, employee relations and HR operations. She has worked with multiple business groups within Honeywell and has leadership experience in dealing with various talent management and organization structure issues. Her strengths include operating in global environments in a matrix and virtual setup. She also has exposure to strategy formulation and execution and implementing organization-wide processes. She's a Green Belt Certified Professional in Honeywell. Our partners for today's webinar is People Strong. Established in 2005, People's Home is leading HR solutions and technology company from India, delivering cutting-edge technology-enabled HR solutions in the space of recruitment, employee lifecycle management, payroll and compliance management, and analytics. The company's enriching experience of over 175 plus customers and over 500,000 users for over a decade now. Known for its penchant to innovate, People Strong has many firsts to its name. The recent one being India's first native HR app, which aims to transform the future of work and work life across corporates and organizations. We have saved time for you to ask questions at the end of the webinar. For those attending the live webinar, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A section. We will try to respond to as many questions as time permits. We have an exciting topic to discuss at this webinar today. So without any further delay, let me invite Sumitha to take over. Thank you, Ritika. So as we start, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what Honeywell uh, is all about and then what has been our focus area in this journey. Honeywell is about 131 Back thousand employees across the world. We are headquarters at Morris Plain, New Jersey, and a Fortune 100 uh, company. We have four main business units from where kind of make our money, and as you know, most of uh, most of that comes from aerospace. So we are into aerospace, into home and building technologies, performance materials and technologies, and safety and productivity solutions. Majority of our sales comes from aerospace, wherein we get close to about 14 
$1.8 dollar billion, followed by homes and building technology, which is about $10.7 billion in sale, performance and material technology, which is about $9.3 billion in sales, and safety and productivity solution, which is $4.6 billion in sales. Uh, overall, end-to-end uh, -end technology companies and who have multiple unmatched scope of offerings across various uh, business lines. If I have to talk briefly um, about each of the business lines uh, to, to kind of give you a flavor, it would be uh, typically in the areas of, say, aerospace, wherein uh, anything from, say, nose to tail is uh, on mechanical and cockpit, cockpit management is something which we kind of offer. We are also into application, service, maintenance, and end-to-end uh, -end connectivity from a hardware uh, airtime standpoint. There is a small business group on turbo uh, chargers, which, which is also part of the aerospace organization, which is responsible for fuel efficiency, is something uh, which we also uh, you know, work on as part of aerospace. Homes and buildings predominantly takes care of the security and the census aspect of homes and buildings. We work a big, big way in connected uh, homes uh, technologies as well, and, and a lot to do with Internet of Things and how we can uh, connect the overall uh, Internet or cloud applications with the products which we have uh, within the organization. Uh, performance materials and technology is typically on the oil and glass sector, uh, a lot to do with um, refineries and how do we kind of work around connected plant technologies. And uh, last but not the least, again, safety and productivity solution is with uh, connecting workers across plants and, and different industries. Um, so if you see our logo talks about the power of being connected, and, and that's what um, Honeywell kind of does across all business units and technology. Coming to Honeywell India, briefly, uh, we are uh, around, uh, you know, 15,000 employees, uh, strong organization, uh, which definitely includes close to about 8,000 engineers, close to about a million dollar in sales currently, uh, and currently working uh, close to about 3,000 product solutions and applications in place. Um, we are spread across uh, across India with uh, close to about seven manufacturing facilities and five global technology development centers. We are typically or you know predominantly present in uh, Bangalore, Pune, uh, Chennai, uh, Gurgaon, and definitely you know uh, Hyderabad, Madurai, and Dehradun as well. Uh, all four business lines of Honeywell is present in India and hence we do end up uh, hiring for all of them. So, so coming to the topic uh, for today, uh, if I had to draw, give you a picture of the kind of hiring needs which this organization has, it ranges from technology hiring to engineering hiring, and of course, uh, uh, various aspects of say marketing, sales, business, and also plant hiring. So it's an end-to-end -end hiring uh, of various technologies, various domains, various business units, which we end up doing uh, for India Honeywell. Uh, from a number standpoint, I would say it's close to about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 hires in a year, um, typically about 350 to 400 hirings per month, which we do. Moving forward, a quick uh, view on the focus areas uh, before I hand over to Anshuman, because this is something wherein we started our journey with People Strong, and uh, and also uh, uh, started focusing on on staffing and recruitment in, in a systematic way uh, for the organization. Uh, the the key focus areas were six for us at Honeywell definitely wanted to improve engagement in staffing. And when I say improve engagement, it was more in terms of how do we provide a high-touch staffing environment and uh, how do we ensure that hiring manager and candidate uh, satisfaction is seemingly addressed while we do that high-touch uh, you know, uh, recruitment process for the group. Uh, right and fast staffing solution, definitely business expectation was shorter cycle time, 
How do we ensure that we get people extremely right and fast? Um, how do we eliminate waste in staffing process? How do we see that wherever there is a uh, issue with respect to additional processes, additional steps, more time being uh, taken to kind of get a right candidate on board? How do we eliminate waste and make the process much more leaner? And of course, quality of profiles. So first pass yield, how many hit ratios we are having, and whether we are able to really pick people with the first set of profiles which we receive was a big ask from us. Uh, strong governance, we, we, are, we were extremely diversified across uh, India as a country as well. So though, though I say that um, I, you know, it, it's Honeywell India, but then it's like six to seven different legal enti entities and, and each business used to operate in their own uh, uh, manner. So the complexity was extremely high and one of the asks was to how do we standardize and how do we centralize all our staffing processes so that the experience is uniform across and, uh, and hence a strong governance to make sure that happens uh, through process improvements and through specific governance, uh, business specific governance review challenging status quo. Uh, the fourth one is on analytics and insight. Definitely uh, whenever we work with uh, any external partner on large database, that is one of the big, big uh, ask uh, from the organization that how do we look at the current data? Do we get some predictive analytics? Do we get some, uh, you know, artificial intelligence from the data which is currently there in the system? And, and if we can do something differently from that. Um, the fifth one was on tighter delivery. So at any point in time, for the business boots on ground was the main uh, ask uh, that whether how many people I have at any point in time. And hence, for us, it was very crucial that any point in time we are able to fill 90% of their ask and, and follow a factory model of first in, first out uh, kind of approach. So a very strong focus on tight delivery. Last but not the least, uh, recruiter stability, right? Because uh, this, this goes a long way. Uh, to, to have a very stable staffing organization and to ensure that uh, at any point in time we don't have a recruiter seat vacant uh, so that we are able to meet the business needs. So, so that's pretty much what our focus area had been. I would now request uh, Ritika to hand over to Anshuman uh, the, present, uh, the pre presentation access so that he can take it over for the next slide. Thanks, Omega, for the introduction. Uh, so, we, so, so we at People's Strong, we looked into all the all the statements that came to us when we initiated the RPO engagement. And uh, while we created the solution, guys, we looked at one. We kept one aspect at the core of it: that uh, in operations, it is very likely that we become extremely outcome driven at certain point in time. Almost at all points in time, we are chasing offers. We are chasing. Uh, time turnaround time, et cetera. Uh, while we do all that and while we chase outcomes, it's imperative that we keep the user experience at the center. And the solution principle that we created kept that at the core. Whatever actions we performed, whatever tracks we created, keeping in mind the fact that the user experience should be high, the user experience has to be at the core of the entire entire journey that we provide. So I, I because the group to look at all the solution tracks in that context, user at the center delivering an experiential recruitment solution. That's for how we solutionize the entire solution. Uh, as, as there in the slide, you can look at this. We looked at a couple of elements, supply, structure, people, process, uh, data, engagement. A lot of it flew from what Sumedha just mentioned about her problem statements about Honeywell, what Honeywell wanted us to uh, value add in terms as a partner. So supply, I mean, a quick, quick, I mean, we look at CV supply is the most important aspect in any recruiting uh, operating job. And uh, while recruiters, of course, work on the CV supply forum, we said we create a solution around a dedicated COE structure, dedicated sourcing arm providing CV supply crowdsourcing solutions. By crowdsourcing, we mean providing this last mile CV supply solution. For instance, 
Honeywell is to I mentioned is a diversified spread out organization. There are requirements in ag locations like Vadodara, for example. If we were looking for an oil and gas professional in Vadodara, we needed recruiters sometimes or, or sources on the ground. The crowdsourcing network enabled us to, to, to do that last mile connectivity, that last mile reach and improve our supply and connectivity. Uh, we, we, we also put up what we call as a central employee reference cell when we look at any uh, supply solution. Of course, you can source CVs externally. You also look at a lot of internal CV mining. How can those CVs be appropriately used, appropriately mined, and therefore we set up an employee referral cell centrally and ensure that the referrals were being taken care of and referral numbers are looking pretty healthy. We looked at structure and people as the next element in a couple of points when we looked at, we looked at role of people. What kind of role do people perform? Recruiters which should, should perform engagement while, uh, as I mentioned earlier, sourcing QA is perform the job of enabling the CV supply. We set up an onboarding function also, and it's a very important initiative in the Honeywell RPO scheme of things. We said the recruiters perform engagement, sourcers supply the CV, let the onboarding team manage the job of releasing the offers, post-offer engagement, post-offer coordination, and all the formalities. These three as a tripod work together and deliver the same solution that we were talking about. Uh, diversity was an important ask in Honeywell and, 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 and therefore we centrally drove diversity as an agenda, creating a spot to supply sufficient diversity CV. Some of the SBUs are extremely diversity friendly, uh, while some of them tend to be uh, not so diversity friendly in terms of the talent availability. It was important that while the teams on the ground uh, met uh, numbers, supply CVs, is there a dedicated focus on diversity and therefore that came in very important. Uh, campus, which is UR, the university relations, that is driven centrally. UR is an important component. Honeywell hires about 500 people uh, annually from campuses and uh, we looked at a central team driving this agenda, uh, which campuses to go, how do you brand Honeywell there, what kind of engagements do you run, and how do you execute the entire uh, event. Needless to say, the campus also helps us impact the diversity agenda in the Honeywell scheme of things. We looked at process and metrics and the long list of things that we did, of course, uh, SLAs, KPI, process standardization, I mean, ensuring that while the solution gets delivered, so the teams are based in Bangalore, Pune, Gurgaon, all locations. Uh, it's a blend of on-site, off-site model, and therefore, how do we devil, deliver standardized uh, deliveries across geographies, across biz businesses, and therefore processes were standardized, they were monitored and audited to ensure that as a customer, uh, everybody felt that the service was being delivered in one way, in one form across businesses. Multiple process interventions we've done, we'll, I'll talk about some critical ones in the future slide, but largely, guys, the take was that look at process, identify NVAs, kill those NVAs, make the process lean, uh, make the process lean and smart. So we, we, I, I talk about some of these interventions as I move ahead. As Sumeda mentioned, that team stability was an important element, and uh, uh, Honeywell being a high-touch organization, uh, how is the entire exit entry of a new resource, exit of an existing and an entry of a new resource managed? Uh, how do you ensure that uh, the end user doesn't get impacted by that and therefore we, we, we created the entire process on the uh, entry of new members in the RPO team and how the exit is going to happen, what kind of handoffs will happen, how it will happen. Again, the intent was the end user should see a seamless, effortless handover and there should not be glitches ar ar around that. So we worked on that because it, it was an important intervention. Uh, another important thing that we set up, uh, and I'm now moving a little from the process to uh, the numbers actually, uh, we, we, we started setting up business-wise monthly targets. Let's say if we had X number of recs, how many of those recs will we offer a close within the month? And uh, we, started this we started this practice and across businesses set up monthly offer targets and this offer was further divided into uh, which would be diversity offer. So, the target setting process was put in place. The teams were aligned on the numbers and the targets, and the teams know that as a process, every month uh, there is an offer target, there's a diversity target which has to be delivered and chased. 
we set up a benchmark that will be 90% on rec fulfillment, which means if 100 recs are open, we will close 90 of them within the month. That's the kind of right and fast solution we wanted to del deliver. That's the kind of speed uh, we wanted to adopt. And uh, I mean, mostly we've been able to do the 90% fulfillment uh, month on month. The teams are aligned and the teams deliver on that number month on month. Uh, we, 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 while we delivered everything in speed and all this stuff and keeping experience again at the core, uh, initiate the process that all, all voice of customer inputs, all escalations, all complaints are logged at a central place. They are monitored, centrally reviewed, and I kind of present it out to Sumeda and other stakeholders. What are we doing on those VOCs? There's a formal mechanism to track VOCs. Uh, track outcomes and formally close a VOC. Again, imperative because if you're delivering experience, you can't deliver it without having a central VOC me monitoring mechanism. Data, like uh, Sumitha mentioned, is an extremely important task, and you can't run a recruiting operation without uh, data. So, uh, multiples, and we'll talk of this data part more in detail in the ensuing slide, but we use a combo of weekly flashes, dashboard, delay reports, etc., etc. Largely the intent work, guys, if anything is not visible, it can't be controlled, it can't be impacted. And therefore we ensure that we use a plethora of uh, uh, flashes and data and dashboards and flash it to multiple stakeholders so that you're able to drive that, uh, yes, this is where things are not going right, this is where it needs immediate impact. Uh, that it, in fact, that has been one of the most important element in being able to deliver the numbers that we have been able to. Last, uh, the engagement part, and I mean, as, as, like any outsourcing structure, we have a spot to spot uh, mapping, and uh, we have a defined review governance framework. We'll talk up more about engagement and review framework also in the ensuing slides. Uh, we also looked at agenda co-creation, and, and, and it's very important that when you deliver an agenda in any uh, outsourcing relationships, there are multiple stakeholders, user departments involved. Are we going to build buy-in of all those and kind of uh, Sumeda helped us in creating that agenda and together we went and uh, be it the HR team, be it the business team, built buy-in. And uh, with HR, we work very closely. In fact, co-create the agenda with HR so that largely everybody is aligned with what we want to deliver, what you want to achieve, and how do you want to do that. This, guys, what essentially what we looked at as the solution along these buckets. I'll uh, try and what we try to do further was to look at uh, while these were the large track of things, what were the key things that made the difference? Within the overall solution principle, what were the key differences that made the difference? And my next slide talks about that. Uh, you'll see elements of the solution principle here, uh, here as, as well. If you can see, the first element we looked at was communication, and I use this word over-communicate. There is nothing in, in a relationship like an RPO kind of an engagement, I don't think there's anything called we will not communicate or there's less communication. You have to communicate, you have to over-communicate, in fact, like I've emphasized. So a number of forums we created, which is a combination of reviews, uh, roadshows, workshops, VOCs, etc., to ensure that the communication lines were always buzzing. There were clear-cut, transparent processes moving. People were aware. People were aware of what is happening. Everything was visible. Uh, I'd like to talk about some of the a very important intervention was uh, uh, was that of setting up the weekly business reviews and a weekly ops review that we set up. Uh, while the businesses got reviewed with the respective spots in a week week on week, at the central level, uh, me and Sumedha ran uh, run a weekly ops review also in which we kind of bulletize all action items, put across actionables, and at a central level so that we're able to monitor and see where are we at a macro level, how are we moving, and the scorecard gets flashed every week uh, to, to the stakeholders. We set up a bi-monthly steercom. I mean, we're often used to uh, uh, in fact, initially we are doing a weekly steercom also. We all are used to steercom being run maybe once a month or uh, once a quarter perhaps in certain RPO relationships or outsourcing relationships. Uh, as I said, the emphasis was to over-communicate. 
Therefore, we had a weekly SteerCom running for almost almost seven eight months, and then we shifted to a bi bi monthly frequency of the same. Again, at a central level, be able to uh, monitor movements. The data and dashboards, as I mentioned earlier, were the second element that made a lot of difference. Uh, weekly diversity flash, KPIs were flashed every week. There's a business delay tracking flash intake meeting adherence flash, multiple flashes, multiple dashboards, multiple inputs that we run and keep uh, educating, keep talking to all stakeholders about how we are performing. The third element was the alignment element, which I spoke, as I said, extremely important and critical that we align all stakeholders, HR and staffing as an ongoing process. Uh, when we give monthly targets to the teams, uh, there is an HR tip, a team also which gets impacted by those numbers and therefore are we building buy-in of those numbers before we go ahead and announce it to the entire universe. I think that was an important initiative and Sumedha was very helpful in helping us build that buy-in of HR folks in this entire agenda. We did a number of process interventions and the list is endless but I'll pick up three of the most important part. One was uh, uh, re-engineered the entire process in which uh, the RECs get assigned and that was, an that was an opportunity element because somewhere the RECs uh, get open and how quickly do you get assigned? You, you, we can lose one or two or three days also if the RECs don't get assigned immediately. It's open somewhere in the system and uh, if it's left to one or two people to assign it and not monitored, you can lose precious one or two days impacting your TTF ev eventually. We set up a traffic cop process in India which was different and we made sure that delivery managers themselves assign the, assign the recs in time. There's a flash that goes every day in the system which uh, publishes to the staffing team and to the RPO team which recs are not assigned within one day. And we kind of rag that red and immediate flashes go out that there's a delay here. So the process was extremely well engineered and controlled. We've been able to save precious days, which would have otherwise gotten lost had this not happened. As I mentioned, role realignment, we realigned the role of recruiters and offers and sources and ensured that the tripod resulted in the right outcomes. The right people focus on the right interventions. Recruiters shouldn't focus on creating offers or running BGVs or coordinating for medical. They should focus on what they're good at, which is engagement, talent supply, talent ad advisory. So I, I, I think that was an important process intervention. And uh, uh, then of course, uh, it's an ongoing process. We keep reviewing the processes, we keep reviewing and keep adding interventions. Team capability, team stability, needless to is extremely important agenda and we use a multiple forums to engage and make our teams more capable. I won't read at all of them. There's a set of rewards and recognitions, quarterly town halls, a set of entire activities and engagement and r and R framework, which ensures that the guys who actually perform the job on the ground are engaged, are extremely excited, and receive all the input that are needed. We run um, uh, two anchor training programs with the Honeywell team. I mentioned two of them. One is a domain certification program that we are running for all our team members, which is an ongoing thing. And second is a, 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 a behavioral training program, which we call it Pride series of sessions, which Sumedha and her team, we co-anchor along with them and deliver. These are, uh, these are weekly, twice a month or monthly programs, so that recruiters see that there's a visible value add happening as they work with Honeywell and PeopleStrong. I'll move to the solution journey now. I mean, in terms of, uh, I've, I've spoken about what was our solution we looked at, uh, what were the key things that made the difference. As I mentioned when I started off, the emphasis was on experience. Uh, outsourcing relationships tend to start uh, with efficiency. Uh, how do you evolve to an experiential RPO is something that we, that we endeavor to take the journey on, and I'll briefly talk about that journey. When we started the journey, our, our, our version one of our design, of our structure, was about recruiters and processors in which recruiters were doing the sourcing and offer creation and processors were doing the post-offer coordination, a very simple model. The intent was just deliver, uh, maintain the numbers, deliver the efficiencies, get the metrics in control, 
and keep uh, maintaining the numbers. That, that was the first version when we started for the first three, four months. We evolved this into what we called as the next journey in any outsourcing relationship, which is about efficiencies are getting in control. Can we start or can we initiate engagement? It's not that engagement was, would not be happening earlier, but uh, with efficiencies and metrics in control or looking like to be in control, uh, can we start the higher order ask of also talking more and more to the businesses, to the customers and uh, engagement. So our next model was when we broke, broke up the role into three parts. Uh, the recruiters to do uh, sourcing, engagement, uh, be accountable for metrics. The sourcers will do the CV supply and talent mapping and the onboarding focus will do the offer creation and the post offer coordination. We were on, on this journey and then we looked at uh, version 2.0 Oh, which is actually what we are executing right now, in which we have, again, the three buckets. However, the sourcing function has been completely segregated. The sourcing function lies entirely with the sourcing theory, making the recruiters free to engage and to deliver experience. That, uh, guys, was is the intention that recruiters should be accountable. The front end, the guys who are there talking to the customers, should be accountable only for three things. How efficient are your metrics? engage with the stakeholders, deliver an experiential recruitment solution. They should be supported by the sourcers, so the, and, and, and the transaction of sourcing is to be performed by the sourcers. Yeah, the onboarding specialists perform the job of doing the post-selection coordination. And that's the journey how it has been covered over the last few years when we started in 2016 till date. Uh, Sumedha, you can add at any point in time if you uh, if, if there are any inputs that you want to put on. Yeah, sure, Anshuban. No, I'm good. Please, please proceed. Sure. I'll uh, quickly talk about what we were when we started and uh, we looked at, and guys, you should look at this, this journey right from the efficiency metrics being controlled and the experience outcomes being targeted now. What we were in 2015 and when we started off the uh, relationship, I'll quickly talk, talk about the numbers. We were at an AOP manning number of 94%. Uh, early fills, uh, for this uh, knowledge of the audience, early fills is a part of TTF only. When we look at a TTF uh, of a certain number, uh, we said that a certain set of recs have to close even earlier than the TTF target. So if, if the TTF target was 53 days, can certain requisitions close within 40 days? Because in any, uh, in any group of requisition, you'll always have those 100 days plus recs also. You can't close every rec at 53 days also. You need to have some recs closing under 40 days to be able to provide that uh, leverage to the recs which are aging. So that's a concept that we picked, that we picked up and set up targets. We were in an early fill percentage of 43%. TTF was 61 days, vendor hiring 26, diversity was 24 and we were running a satisfaction score of 6.9 on candidate on the hiring manager and an 8.2 of uh, uh, the candidate community. Uh, Sumitra, would you like to take up the outcomes? I'll, I'll kind of run the slides. Yeah, sure. So thanks, Anshuman. And I think uh, all of you would agree. I mean, whatever we have been doing, unless and until we, we see an outcome in terms of metrics, it, it doesn't really matter, right? And for the business, uh, and the, the best uh, way to kind of look at a staffing performance is, is how fast and how easy I'm getting my position filled. So, so I'm glad to kind of share these numbers with you, and I think this has been typically over a period of, um, uh, say, uh, close to about two years now when we have been able to achieve that. So Anshuman did speak about uh, some of the metrics which we where at at the beginning of the engagement and what you see on the right hand side is something what we are now currently so when i say aop aop is nothing but um, you know the our sensors so uh, like from a census fulfillment standpoint where do we stand and if you see we are currently at a 96 percent and and of course heading towards a, a close to a 98 percent kind of a target in mind, there might be some attrition in the quarter four or so. Early fills have been very good for us. We have been filling positions faster, so close to 
50% of our positions we have been able to fill within the defined timeline. Uh, TTS is nothing but total time to fill, so which is currently at 43 days, as again 61 when we started. Our agency hiring has also gone down a lot, and this is another area wherein our, our business really sees values from staffing because we do expense a certain amount of cost when we partner with RPO, and an agency cost is, is an addition to that, right? So if you're able to bring down the agency cost, uh, ensuring that our direct sourcing through our RPO partner kind of goes up, it really uh, uh, brings in dollar value back to the business. So agency, we have been really able to reduce from 26 to 10%. Um, diversity hiring, I think Anshuman touched upon it, has been a big focus area, and uh, and you see there are some improvements there as well. And last but not the least, on the candidate and HM SAT. Um, having said that, I think um, uh, we are in a stage wherein, of course, we started with learning, we we adopting new practices, experimenting, uh, running prototypes, and and if we are failing, just you know changing it again and doing it. Uh, in a different way. So extremely, I would say, um, agile way of getting things done, uh, quickly learning, adopting, and then sharing uh, whatever we have learned, and then, of course, uh, guiding the rest of the organization so that we are able to maintain a, a steady uh, performance. Um, and, and, of course, having said that, this is not the end, right? I mean, uh, though, though we have started on this journey, there are still lots to achieve from our overall, um, say, experience and satisfaction standpoint, uh, which which we are of course, uh, you know, jointly partnering to to kind of get that uh, get that going as well. So so this is not the, something wherein we have you know that the best in class kind of a score, but definitely uh, something wherein we have learned and and we have improved from where we started our journey in 2015. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, and this would be our last slide before we kind of open up for Q&A. What's new, right? And as I said, I think continuous improvement, uh, challenging status quo, and while uh, you know looking at something through an innovative uh, lens is something uh, which which we need to keep on doing if we need to kind of stay ahead of the game. I always believe that while journey excellence is very, very tough, but staying on the spot of excellence for a long time is tougher, right? So it's important to kind of continuously innovate. And with that um, uh, focus in mind, uh, this, these are some of the new things which we are kind of focusing on. I'm sure uh, being in the industry, all of you would have heard about these as well. So not something new, but then definitely this is where the industry is moving from a staffing standpoint. So uh, new things which we have tried in 2017 is, of course, mapping of identified skills. We have created lists of critical skills with us, and, and we have started doing proactively pipelining on those skills so that we don't end up you know, losing time when those kind of wrecks are open. So we are really leveraging a lot on a lot on predictive analytics to kind of get that done. Uh, the second thing is on video series. Um, a lot of time, our managers are keen to see the person in in person and then take a call. And most of the time, because of time gaps, time differences, they are not able to do that. So, uh, not to uh, delay the staffing process, we have introduced video series for some of our hirings wherein a manager, when, when they see the CV for the first time, they see a video interview as well of that person. And that enables us to move faster because uh, the manager is able to quickly take a call looking at how the person has done the video interview and move ahead in the process. Thirdly, we have started a lot on technical assessment. We do a huge number of software hiring. We do a huge number of, uh, I would say, technical hiring, and most of the time, Apart from the interviews, uh, we we also do a lot of evidence-based hiring. So so the technical assessments, online assessments, play a, uh, for us to pick up guys whom we usually call for hackathons. We have been doing hackathons um, for almost close to a year now for our technical and software hiring, and this has been, I think, one of the new things. Uh, 
which, which, which has really helped us get the right talent in the organization. Uh, some of the remaining focus, and these are ongoing focus for us this year, diversity, I'll not uh, talk hard about it more because this is definitely a critical area for us. How do we optimize source mix? As I said, um, improving our direct source and, and looking at other mechanisms as well. How do we in improve the referral channel or how do we uh, really improve our internal job channel and reduce dependency on agency to provide dollar value back to the business is, is a constant focus area for us. And of course, last but not the least, um, the overall hiring manager experience because that's, that's the end, uh, I would say, objective of, of whatever we put in place that we are able to give a wow experience to our managers. Anshuman, you would like to talk about the next aspect in terms of whatever we'll focus on in 2018? Uh, some uh, some some of the elements you've captured, not all, of course, but some of the el elements we're looking at as we look at uh, rejuvenating the way referrals happen in Honeywell RPO and uh, continue our focus uh, on the referral as an important source of uh, CVs that come to us. We are looking at uh, app-enabled referral program and. Uh, we're already preparing the blueprint around that and should go live shortly that we'll enable each of the uh, Honeywell members to have an app. Uh, everybody uses a smartphone and therefore have an app and the person will be able to refer CVs, track how the referrals are moving on the app itself and we'll make it very exciting we're looking at. So we're working with Sumedha on working out this solution. We feel that uh, referrals will be a big thing once we are able to implement the app-based solution uh, in the Honeywell R RPO. We are, we are also looking at creating a, what we call as a job description and a CTQ repository. Guys, CTQ implies critical to quality. So when we look at any job description, uh, after going through it, we use an intake meeting as a forum uh, with the hiring manager to create a set of key asks about the position. Those key asks are what we call a CTQ. JDs can be a lengthy document, try and bucketize or bulletize it into five or six, what are the key things that we are looking for. So we are working on a solution where we create an ecosystem and a central repository uh, of all job descriptions and their CTQs somewhere. Once we're able to execute this, I think it will enable us to do phenomenal amount of analysis, phenomenal amount of contextual data will come to us, and a lot of interesting insights could be delivered if I'm able to, uh, able to let's say, uh, crunch through all the four, 500 job description and their CTQs together. So that's one step in building up institutional memory, as we call it, of the recruiting organization. So we, we are on the job on that. We've initiated that. The third quick bit is the campus hiring, and it's a very important focus area for Honeywell this year. Uh, this year and ahead also that uh, we hire 500 people from campus and therefore uh, the entire program of uh, how the engagement will happen has been anchored. We have created a blueprint and we are executing this right now as we are talking in 2017. Uh, the fourth critical element which uh, we are working on is behavioral assessments. Uh, we already do uh, technical assessments for all our recruiting uh, uh, recruitments. We are also looking at behavioral assessments. Honeywell has recently, 2017, moved into eight uh, behavioral traits that uh, ideal an ideal Honeywell employee should possess or should ideally be uh, possessing them and should be uh, measured on. And we are looking at creating a scientific framework around that so that interviews and behavioral assessment enable it to get the right talent with the right speed and the right efficiencies. That's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anshuman and Sumedha, for the great insights. We have very limited time left for Q&A uh, section. We have had overwhelming response from our listeners. We would really request uh, both of you to try and uh, answer as many questions as we can. The first question is for uh, you, Anshman. Would you uh, share your experience on uh, dealing with shortlisted candidates, you know, dropping out uh, in the last minute? 
and uh, how was the situation handled uh, in um, uh, Honeywell and uh, what interventions were done to avoid recurrence? I mean, it's a great disappointment at any point in time if a candidate drops out, but you can't prevent that, guys. What you can do is to prevent it, create an EWS mechanism, early warning signs. Uh, make sure that uh, you're well connected with the candidate, uh, with the recruiter or whichever function is well connected with, with the candidates at all times. And the moment you spot a disconnect or a disengagement happening, put across that EWS immediately to all stakeholders, staffing, HR, and the hiring managers. You can't kill this problem, but yes, operations is about no surprises. Use EWS mechanism to kill surprise, give the bad news. People don't mind hearing the bad news if you go with the bad news and a solution in time. Thank you, Anshuman. Uh, there is another question now for Sumedha. There's a question from Sareen. It says, understanding business is very important for uh, recruiters and uh, sources to support in hiring. What are the challenges in training the sources and recruiters on the business understanding? Uh, with the complex business with uh, which Honeywell, which is uh, Honeywell into and how is that managed? Okay, yeah, great question. So uh, definitely it's, it's not always easy because uh, uh, we deal with, uh, of course, uh, a group of people. I mean, the primary focus is, of course, to kind of fill the job quickly and, and hence, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating that business acumen, knowledge of the business, in order to do the search becomes extremely, I would say, uh, critical. So a couple of things which we have started doing. Uh, number one, uh, we do host business, uh, uh, you know, sessions like business orientation sessions uh, for our recruiters. So uh, those are usually once a quarter wherein we request a business leader to come and address small groups in respective sites. Uh, we also make our recruiters attend induction programs. So uh, every time when induction is, induction is happening, because induction usually covers a lot on the business, uh, overall the policies and, and the overall, uh, say, uh, vision, mission of the organization. And recruiters do kind of attend those sessions, sit in, uh, get their understanding, and then kind of come back to the job. Last but not the least, mentioning, we have started something called PRIDE. And PRIDE is nothing but uh, an abbreviation. So if I have to expand the abbreviation, it says personal responsibility in driving excellence. So we hold each uh, recruiter to be personally responsible in order to drive experience. And we use those PRIDE sessions to drive multiple things. And those happens every week, every Thursday between 3 to 4 p.m. And uh, if you have to maybe, uh, you know, uh, experience a Honeywell recruiter, you, you can kind of see uh, how they kind of behave on those sessions. So we try to uh, give the trainings as, as common as possible so that the experience which they impart is, is consistent and is standardized. So those are some of the things which we have been doing to, to deliver or to inject business acumen. Thank you so much, Sumita. The next question for Anshuman. Our listener, uh, he says the role of recruiter is set to significantly change with this transformation. Um, what are some of the talent advisory elements that the recruiters are expected to focus on in the new scheme of things? Yeah, I mean, what in terms of the focus area for recruiters, yes, the role has transformed and therefore, the, as I mentioned, the three focus areas for the recruiter is be accountable for the metrics, that's an efficiency, engagement, and experience. Overall, ensure that the way the recruiting operation functions, keep the user at the center, and while we are delivering it in time, is there ease, is there transparency, and is there visible value add from the recruiter's standpoint? Yeah, is that... Uh, is, does that answer oh, the sorry. question? I mean, those are three things that we were looking at for the recruiters to perform. I think, I think that does answer the question, uh, Anjuman. The next question from our listener, uh, Anju John, uh, is for Sumida. Uh, when you say alignment with HR, uh, what is the role expected from the HR teams in Honeywell? 
So definitely, uh, HR uh, plays a very, very important role uh, in our organization. And uh, uh, HR generalist role is a role wherein, you know, uh, the, the respective HR generalist is responsible for end-to-end, -end, uh, I would say, HR delivery of the organization. And uh, staffing definitely becomes um, a key part of that, right? So if you really want to influence the business, impact the business, support the business in their growth, or one of the best way to get that done is, is ensuring that they get their people quickly so that they don't have any gaps in the projects, right? So our main intent was to ensure that we do have that alignment with our HR partners in, so that they know how many positions they have, how many aged positions they have, where all it is stuck, how fast we need to move, and uh, you know, bring up that visibility up to the HR partner so that they are able to remove roadblocks for us, um, work with the business to kind of um, you know negotiate or mediate if we are facing any any problem or escalate issues or resolve issues if if there are certain is issues which we are facing. So that's the role um, typically when when I say that it was alignment with HR because it was a common goal. It was not that. Uh, it's a staffing team, so staffing team has to figure out how to get their jobs filled, and um, HR uh, does play a role only in conducting interviews or doing uh, comp benchmarking. It was it it is it is never that way at Honeywell. It's a partnership from day one, wherein HR participates in intake meetings. HR works with the recruiter very very closely to to ensure that uh, we are able to fill the job fast for the business. Thank you so much, uh, Sumida. Uh, I think we have time for just one more last question. Um, I'm not sure who it would be addressed to. I will read the question and uh, uh, you can decide. What sort of recruiter to stakeholder ratio do you have? And would you have an idea on what is the best practice ratio? This is a question by Praveen Nair. So we didn't map it, at least in Honeywell, we didn't map it with the stakeholders. But definitely, we mapped our recruiter basis the HR organization. So the way the, the cohorts are created or the pairings are done is typically uh, HRG or HRBP will have uh, one recruiter to kind of work with, right? So if the HRBP is supporting two groups, um, there might be one recruiter who is supporting that two groups. So we created that cohorts keeping HRBP um, uh, ratio in mind, and and I think typically at any point in time, uh, if I talk about the requisitions, uh, and and a recruiter is equipped to handle close to about 15 to 20 requisitions at at any point in time, at least in the organization. Anshuman, would you like to talk about the ideal number? No, ideally, Sumedha, in terms of uh, in terms of numbers per rec recruiter, it's uh, it depends varies heavily from industry to domains to etc. But yeah, typically across RPOs, we look at a uh, we look at a number for about uh, 15 to 20 uh, recs to be there. Uh, 15 on the lower side, 20 on the high side. That's the number that we benchmark on, and Honeywell we've kept the same number. Uh, thank you again, Anshuman and uh, Sumedha. Um, with this last question here, um, and we, we, are, we are going to wrap up of today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have a lot of questions waiting for both of you, so I request uh, uh, Anshuman and Sumeda to take them offline for our listeners who are really eager to have answers to their questions. Um, once again, we thank today's webinar partner, People Strong. Our special thanks to our speaker, Anshuman and Sumedha, for this webinar and invaluable information that uh, they have shared with us today. I would uh, like to thank everybody in the webinar audience for participating in today's presentation. Stay tuned for many more such exciting sessions. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you.